Hello, everyone. Welcome. Thank you. Thanks so much for coming, braving the weather to come out tonight to patent progress and commercialize medicine. Um, a very special thanks for Jim Brown. Is that my water? Perfect. That's good. 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 Jim Brown uh, for coming today. And his flight was on time and he just got here, so all is good. Um, I also want to extend a very special thanks to our sponsors tonight, the Dalhousie Health Law Institute, Dalhousie Department of Philosophy, and tomorrow there are a bunch of <coughs> events um, that I think Gordon will mention briefly um, that Jim is taking part of as well. The University of King's College History of Science and Technology Program, Novel Tech Ethics, and the Nova Scotia Health Research Foundation, and Evidence for Democracy for helping to spread the word. Uh, and Situating Science. So I'm the project coordinator for Situating Science. This is a national, national networking and partnership building project funded by the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council of Canada. We promote communication and collaboration among folks in humanities and social studies as well as the sciences that are engaged in the study of science and technology, putting science in social and cultural contexts, and connecting folks via workshops, conferences, lecture series like this, uh, summer schools, there's one this summer, uh, and more across the country and internationally. We have dozens of videos, publications, podcasts, blogs, and hundreds of events available on our website and YouTube channel, so check those out. Google Situating Science or go to our website, situsci.ca. We are joined by other folks, um, a couple dozen folks, I think, um, virtually tonight via live stream, so hello to them. And there is a reception afterwards. Stick around, eat some food. I know you're all starving. Um, afterwards in the hallway just outside the doors. So this event marks part four of the Lives of Evidence National Lecture Series, which examines the cultural, ethical, political, and scientific role of evidence in our world. So far we had a great big event with Scott Finley from Evidence for Democracy speaking on accountability in the future of Canadian science. Renowned bioethicist Carl Elliott speaking on psychiatric research abuse, and before that Cindy Patton on inventing the crystal meth HIV connection. All of these are in the process of being uploaded to our YouTube channel, if you want to check those out. After Jim, you'll still be able to watch the rest of the series live online. The godfather of bioethics, so I'm told, um, Joel Lexton, uh, will speak on the role of evidence in the pharmaceutical industry and clinical trials on Thursday, April 10th. Finally, the Canada Research Chair in Philosophy of Science, Stathis Silos, will speak on the war on science, it's nothing new in Ottawa, April 10th, and then Toronto, April 16th, and that will conclude our lecture series. I'm also, we're in the process, Donna Haraway, as many of you know Donna Haraway, or Fred or know of her work, um, she's speaking at Edmonton Monday, March 24th, and we're in the process of confirming a live stream of that event, um, so stay tuned to our social media and our website just to see an update on all that information. We won't know probably for the next Hmm, little while, maybe the weekend, <laughs> before we can confirm that. Um, they're working on it very hard right now. There are feedback forms on your chairs and for a list of some of the upcoming events from the sponsor organizations, but also Jim Brown's events tomorrow, there's a list on the flip side of those. Without further ado, here's Gordon McHewitt, Director of Situating Science and many other things in his life. <laughs> Whether or not he's Director of them, I don't know. Um, who will quickly introduce our speaker, Gordon. Tag team. Um, that, if she didn't tell you, is Emily Tector, who is the brains behind Situating Science uh, Cluster. And all of the things that she's referring to can be found by Googling Situating Science, and it'll come up, and a, a, a little riot of things that we've done over the past six her seven years are on there uh, of all kinds of activities uh, and hopefully plans for the future uh, as we extend our cluster into another year. We're very pleased to host this national lecture series on the lives of evidence in the midst of uh, debates about the death of evidence uh, to explore both the origins, the meaning, uh, the civic place of the ideas of evidence is important to our civil society and the very understanding of what we uh, know of as being science, reason, and the modern. And since this is a crucial issue, since there's so much debate about what it is to have evidence for something, uh, including political processes and claims about what our future will look like, um, it's right that Canadians and Canadian historians, philosophers, and sociologists of science take a close look at this. 
We are very pleased today to uh, host uh, James Brown, not the soul singer, the, uh, uh, the philosopher, eminent philosopher of science, um, uh, a well-known Canadian uh, philosopher of science and uh, a public intellectual, one of the few public intellectuals in Canada because he uh, is, uh, if you're in Ontario, you'll see him on TV Ontario and CBC uh, constantly debating whatever issue that he wants to put the boot into. Uh, he and I go way back. Uh, in fact, he taught me uh, logic uh, when I was about that high. Uh, <laughs> and he, uh, uh, I have a sort of same tra trajectory. Uh, he was a miner in his uh, youth in Sudbury uh, while I was a printer and came into university late. And he is at University of Toronto and I'm at King's College. I did better. Um, <laughs> they, um, and I have a, a chance to apologize to him in public for the first time. Uh, he hired me as an undergraduate uh, uh, research assistant when he put together his first book, I think, on the philosophy, uh, natural philosophy of Leibniz, right? It's possible. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I was to put together the index, and, end, uh, and it, some people heard the story. And I was crossing Queen's Park with the collection of the index and the index cards, and I tripped. <laughs> and all the cards flew across the uh, Queen's Park in a flutter of wind, and I gathered them. And we had a very short time to put together the uh, index on the book to get it to the publisher, which was Brill, I think, or some, one of the uh, Amsterdam publishers and uh, so I put it very quickly together and it was published and I panicked and I got my uh, uh, copy of it and I opened up and the first reference was wrong <laughs> and I've never opened the book uh, since. Uh, so uh, don't worry, you can make up for it. Yeah, really. I brought some grading with me on this trip. Uh, uh, Jim is an uh, author of many more books other than the Natural Philosophy of Leibniz, uh, including uh, the uh, first real blistering philosophical attack on the social constructivism, uh, the rational and the social, uh, his uh, laboratory of the mind on thought experiments done very recently, uh, Smoke and Mirrors, the philosophy of mathematics. Uh, he's done a book which many of you read, Who Rules in Science, which some people uh, uh, waggishly call Who Rules Out Science. Um, <laughs> and uh, a collections, he, he runs the Jarovnik um, regular uh, spring, I guess, uh, meeting on philosophy of science, has edited some of the major journals. And we won't hold it against him that he is a Platonist, uh, but he is one. Uh, but he has much more interesting concerns about the nature of science under the modern university and all of those university administrators, and I see them, some of them here, should listen very, very closely to what he thinks might be wrong with the direction that we're doing in our uh, uh, funding of science and of research in general. Mm -hmm. Jim Brown. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Um, this sounds m much too loud to me. Is it far too loud to you? It's OK? It's ringing in my ears. Oh, that's why. Uh, I'm going to, oh, this is better. I'm just going to stand back a little bit, though it feels unnatural. Um, it is an enormous pleasure to be here. And I want to thank uh, those who invited me and uh, those who uh, made the arrangements for the trip and everything. I am truly grateful. I love Halifax. It was my first academic job was at Dalhousie. I have, for more than 30 years, had a tremendous sentimental attachment uh, to this place. And it's every now and then. I don't come back often enough. I wish I came more often. But whenever I do come back, I'm always pleased to be here. And, uh, and, th and it's true this time even though the, the weather brought back some memories <laughs> as well. In fact, your weather is even worse than ours. I left cold, blustery day, and I came here to a slightly warmer day, but the wind is still howling, and the rain was terrible, and so on. So anyway, I'm going to talk about the pharmaceutical stuff. And um, let me begin by saying, Abracadabra, or something like that. Come on. There. Okay. 
Maybe, in fact, I have to put it up here so that I can, it'll be responsive. <laughs> All right, we'll fix this. There. Okay, a good story should have a beginning, a middle, and an end, but they don't have to be in that order. And I'm going to end, or sorry, I'm going to begin with the end, with the conclusion. Uh, this loses something in dramatic effect as you build to some spectacular conclusion. But on the other hand, you'll see where I'm going if I tell you where I'm going right from the start. And then you can concentrate entirely on whether the case is convincing or not. What I wanted to argue for is the complete socialization of medical research. No more private stuff, no more public-private partnerships, no more patents, no more royalties, no more intellectual property rights. It has been a disaster. The last 30 years in medicine has been a downhill trajectory. It's much worse than it was 30 years ago, and I'm going to try to convince you that that's true. I'm also going to try to convince you that there's a very easy remedy. You socialize it, and the easiest way to socialize it in a country like Canada is to just roll it into the healthcare system. It would be taken over entirely by universities or maybe some other public agencies to run the way it was from the 70s and earlier with virtually no patents uh, at all. The quality of medicine will skyrocket and a whole lot of stuff, other stuff, will get better too. That's what I'm going to talk about. That's the message. A lot of you will imme imme immediately bristle at this and think this is crazy socialism. It's not. It's really smart socialized medicine. And you all love the healthcare system, or 95% of you do, I'm sure. And you're going to, uh, I hope, see the virtues of thinking of how research ought to be organized and see it in the same sort of light. Okay, here's the problem. How can we ensure high quality medic medicine in the light of corporate research funding and massive con financial conflicts of interest, which are all over the place in medical research, especially pharmaceutical research? And it's a problem in medicine, of course. It's a problem in ethics, politics, public policy, and it's a problem in the philosophy of science. It's all of those things. And here's, here are some of the, the problems that I'm going to talk about. Um, I'm going to talk about antibiotics, corrupting influences in research, um, the problems involved in clinical trials, ghostwriting. I'm not going to talk about all of these. These are some of the things that I'm going to talk about, and maybe you might want to talk about some of them later in question period. Skewed research results, terrible methodological rigidity, and the utter failure of attempts to regulate this. The regulation ideal, which almost everybody, is almost everybody's response to these problems, bring in this sort of regulation or that, they're always behind the time, they make no bloody progress, they're having no effect, and so on. Something completely different is called for. Okay, so let's begin with antibiotics. They're not as good as they were when I was a kid. When I was a kid, no matter what ailed me, my mother would get on the phone, the doctor would come around to the house within an hour, and, the first, and he just walked up the stairs to my bedroom and he had a needle in his hand. He didn't even take my temperature. And he said, roll over, young man. And, and I got a shot of penicillin. And then he'd, take, then he'd say, now what's wrong with you? <laughs> and some of you, if you're old enough, you, may, you might remember those days when antibiotics were used all over the place and they were incredibly effective. They would cure virtually anything. And it is no longer true. It is a disaster what's going on with antibiotics. The problem is drug resistance, and it's the inevitable result of evolution. Um, gonorrhea, for instance, is now treatable by a single antibiotic. And in a few years, gonorrhea will be untreatable. That is, we'll have no direct, we'll, we'll treat it in other ways, I suppose, but we're not going to treat it with antibiotics anymore. And that's going to be, and it's just going to come back with a real vengeance in just a few years. And who's making, this, who's making this terrible situation worse? I'll, well, I'll, rhetorically I ask, could it be the market model of, um, of medical research? Um, here's what, the, what a market model of uh, uh, medicine uh, does. It encourages innovation, 
Okay, let's grant that it's very good at encouraging innovation. It's uh, terrific at bringing new antibiotics quickly to market. And it uh, encourages selling as many antibiotics as possible. That's what a business does. And it encourages all kinds of uses, as many uses as possible, including, including so-called non-therapeutic uses, like in animal feed. Each of those things actually co uh, contributes to the problem of antibiotics. It's not helping, it's hurting. Even people in the pharmaceutical industry will admit that capitalism and antibiotics just do not go together. It's a disaster. It's the, the, the term people throw around is a market failure. Okay, hardly anyone in, who's a gung-ho free enterpriser will admit that anything could be a market failure, but they will admit it in, in this uh, rare case. So, everyone knows we should use less, we should sell less, we should introduce new antibiotics extremely sparingly. If we actually have something new, we should just keep it on the shelf and not use it at all for a very, very, very long time, maybe in a few isolated emergencies. But generally, don't introduce it. Hang on to it. Keep it out of animal feed entirely. The um, Dame Sally Davies, who's um, very important in British health, um, has announced publicly that um, anti antibiotic resistant diseases are an apocalyptic threat. And she's not given to hyperbole. So anyway, if free enterprise can't solve this problem, who should step in? I ask rhetorically. Um, there's a tremendous amount of um, uh, empirical data on the corruption of empirical trials, clinical trials, when they're run by uh, corporations. There's um, all kinds of specialized um, uh, meta studies, and there's even meta meta studies, you know, studies of meta studies. And one of the better ones is uh, by uh, Beckelman uh, called The Scope and Impact of Financial Conflicts of Interest in Biomedical Research, published uh, a while ago in JAMA, which is Journal of the American Medical Association. Um, they're extremely cautious in how they put everything. Okay, they, they're not given, like me, I'm afraid, to uh, hyperbole and uh, uh, dramatic statements or anything like that. But here's how they put it in their very cautious way. Financial relations among industry, scientific investigators, and academic institutions are widespread. Conflicts of interest arising from these ties can influence biomedical research in important ways. Joe Election, um, who was mentioned uh, uh, either by uh, Emily or Gordon as a uh, situating science speaker, I think at Western, he's coming up at Western. Okay, he's terrific on a lot of these things. Anyway, he published a big uh, article called Pharmaceutical Industry Sponsorship and Research Outcome Quality, a Systematic Review in the British Medical Journal. And he got similar findings to Beckelman. If you pool their results, you get a, a result something like this, that published articles are four times more likely to be favorable to the sponsor of the trial. If you have um, papers dis, you know, trying to investigate the properties of some drug by somebody who's neutral, funded purely by government money, you get a much less uh, likelihood of a glowing report. But when the company, the, the, the sponsoring company, has a product involved in here, it's four times more likely to be, you know, you're told this is great stuff. Okay. We have, there's all kinds of cases. You'll have to sort of take my word for it. I won't bludgeon you with all of the data, though it can be bloody impressive to see some of the, uh, how extreme some of these cases can be. Um, what can we do about it? Well, we could require better testing, maybe. Um, maybe we could enforce conflict of interest rules, maybe. Generally, we should require tighter regulations and enforce them. Maybe that would be a good idea. Or we could have a completely different approach, like just socializing the whole process and, taking, and get, getting rid of the uh, tremendous uh, financial incentive to cheat in cases like this. 
Now, one of the reasons it's possible to cheat here, there's probably two explanations for why there is an incredible amount of cheating in pharmaceutical research. One is the stupendous profits. Now, I know that uh, ordinary physicists, chemists, biologists, and so on will cheat in their work. They fudge data and so on. Uh, they're not expecting to make any money out of it, though they, maybe they think they'll get a, a raise or something like that. Uh, but they're not, we're not talking about an ordinary professor suddenly turning into a multi-millionaire. Uh, yet when you're dealing with the pharmaceutical business, people can make billions, stupendous amounts of money. And there the incentive to cheat is very, very high. But there's a second reason you can cheat in pharmaceutical research that you can't cheat in almost anything else in science. Not everything else is, is clear, but, but almost everything else isn't, isn't subject to the same problem. And I'm going to call it one-shot science. Um, when you do, uh, um, ran, you, when you're testing a drug, you, you have to uh, perform these uh, randomized clinical trials. And the claims are from the drug companies that bringing a drug to market costs a few years ago, they were claiming it was 800 million per drug. They're probably claiming it's well over a billion now. That's a lie. That's simply not true. What they do is include a whole lot of marketing costs, and they call it research costs. But even when you, when you do a, a much more conservative and plausible uh, costing of what, it, of what it costs to bring a, a, a drug to trial, you're still going to end up with something like 150 or 200 million dollars per drug, which is still a hell of a lot of money. A lot of philosophers of science, when they think about testing, they actually don't think about the time testing takes or the cost of testing. They just say, well, we can duplicate this result in principle. And it's true, you can duplicate the result in principle. But when you're talking about $200 million to test a drug, you're not going to duplicate it. Nobody's got $200 million to do it again. The first person in was the one who's going to get the uh, IP rights. So the government isn't going to pay a penny to duplicate this because that would be just be a waste of taxpayer money. No other private corporation is going to spend a penny on it because th there's no incentive. All they can do is confirm what was already found. And they're not going to share the royalties. There's no reason in the world why anyone would do it a second time. And it's perfectly reasonable. At $200 million a shot, why the hell would any rational person duplicate the result? We need to worry about something else. We need to worry about how the result is obtained. It's not the only thing that's like this. Um, computer proofs are a lot like this. Now, the very first computer proof was the four-color theorem in the mid-1970s, and it took about 500 hours of what was then state-of-the-art computing. It was an IBM 360 machine, which is apparently not as powerful as your iPhone. But, so you can do the four-color theorem on your iPhone, I suppose. But the thing is, there are a lot of computer results now that are coming out that require thousands of hours of Cray supercomputer time. And it's the same problem. This is one-shot science. You only get to run the software once because of the extraordinary expense. So what are we going to do? We have to control it somehow or other. We, we, it's unlike, uh, uh, you know, if a regular physicist says, he, you know, here, I did this little tabletop experiment and here's what I got. If we don't believe the guy, we simply reproduce it. You can do it in an afternoon and say, nope, we just didn't get the same result. That happened, for instance, in, um, remember the neutron, the, the high temperature neutron energy generator of about 10, 15 years ago, remember that? Uh, that doesn't matter. But the thing is, for an awful lot of results in, in the sciences or in math, you can just check. You can check for yourself. You can reproduce the result. If it's a math proof in a typical journal publication, you know, the theorems may be, the whole paper is maybe five pages long. The central theorem might have a proof that's one or two pages long. And if you've got the background and thousands of people will have it, you can just work through the proof and convince yourself that it actually does work. You cannot do this with a computer with a computer proof of something like the non-existence of the projective plane of order 10, which was proven about, uh, about a decade ago, and it took 5,000 hours of Cray supercomputer time. Nobody's going to run that experiment again. 
So why are we convinced of it? Well, in the case of that mathematician, he made the software publicly available. No one could read the, print, the, the proof anyway. Um, if you uh, actually printed out the proof, it would be millions of pages long. You can't, you can't do it. The comp you trust the computer has done it. So what you have to worry about is the software that generated the proof. Is, it, is the software itself constructed the right way? So you work through it module by module. Yeah, this should take care of that problem. Oh yes, this should take care of this other problem, and so on. This is how you become convinced of a computer proof. But you don't need to run the software again, okay? You're not gonna get anything out of it, and it's incredibly expensive. And it's exactly the same with, um, with randomized clinical trials. You worry about how they're designed. You worry about how they're executed, and so on. Now, the only way you can actually get a grip on, on a randomized clinical trial is to actually control it yourself. You need to do the setup. You need to do the randomizing. You need to make sure you know, there's appropriate blind testing. You need to make sure that the people in the study are appropriate for the study. Um, in the way a lot of this research used to be done more than 30 years ago, people like us would just be asked by our family doctor, would you be willing to uh, participate in a trial? And you think, all right, I'm a good citizen, I'll do that. Now your family doctor, as this is especially true in the US, is paid $10,000 to recruit you. Didn't tell you that, right? But they're paid handsomely to get you in. And it might be a study on blood pressure. And so I want to, re I'm the guy, I'm the doctor, and I want this guy in, he's my patient. He's perfectly healthy. No, his, no maybe his blood pressure is up a couple of points. And, I, and, and we're looking to test a drug where your blood pressure should be really quite high. And I, say, I sort of fudge it. I say, he's got high blood pressure. I want him in my study. I pick up 10,000, but he's not really a good person to have in the study because he doesn't really satisfy the criteria. But if money's involved, people will fudge that way. They'll cheat that way. So we have to go back to a, a time when your family doctor would enroll you in a, in a clinical trial because the family doctor's actually interested in having a better product. Family doctor's not gonna make a buck off this. He's just going to participate in some, in, in some public spirited venture, the way we used to do, and there was no problem about that. It worked really well. Okay. So the only way is to uh, actually control the randomized clinical trial. And um, we can't trust the sponsors to do that, and so we actually have to take control of it. And so here's my first serious proposal. Randomized clinical trials and other research uh, uh, testing techniques um, should be carried out by a publicly funded neutral agency. And that could be something like our, our regular universities. Or maybe we even need to set up um, you know, some kind of public agency to run massive clinical trials because your ordinary, your, your friendly neighborhood biologist is probably not administratively competent to set up a trial with, you know, 10,000 people or something like that. So maybe we could have a public agency, but they're not going to make a buck off that. They're simply running the trials. There's other reasons for this that this is a good thing, too. They'll stop, for instance, they'll just say, I refuse to carry out any uh, clinical trials involving a so-called Me Too drug. This is just a waste, a terrible waste of resources. Okay, so anyway, this might help a lot improving the quality of clinical trials, but there's a lot of other stuff that we have to worry about too. All right, so what am I gonna do here? Well, maybe we'll just have to regulate it, okay? Maybe we'll regulate the industry um, to ensure, uh, you know, quality control of uh, private for-profit um, um, medical research. The trouble with this is it's still, even if it worked ideally, it, there's lots of problems for why it won't work, but, there's, but one of the central problems for why it's not a good idea is this. The trouble with market-driven uh, medical research is that it skews research very, very badly. So there's all kinds of health problems and all kinds of ways that we might approach those health problems. And some of them involve drugs. And drugs are patentable. But other ways of, uh, of achieving uh, uh, very good health results might involve things like diet or exercise or your relation to the environment. And the results of that kind of um, um, empirical research is not, going to, uh, is not going to end up with IP uh, rights. So if I find out that 
you know, his, her terrible case of, of uh, depression is simply due to diet, and if she has a big bowl of broccoli every day, she just cheers right up, <laughs> okay? Um, I can't make a penny off that. Nobody's going to pay, pay royalties for this information. Once it's out there, it's just out there. I, it's not like selling pills. And uh, the same goes for, for um, um, uh, exercise. Okay, there's also even highly regulated, perfectly regulated research will, will still leave private corporations to do things like um, look for uh, uh, treatment of chronic diseases. There's pathetically little work done on vaccines. It's really a crime how little work is being done on vaccines. But by God, there's a ton of work on chronic diseases. The idea from a from a, uh, a pharmaceuticals point of view, the ideal disease for you to have is something that will requires you to take an expensive pill every day for the rest of your life. A vaccine, I might make you know a fair bit of money from a vaccine, but that's it. I'll never see him again. I'll never get another penny out of him. I want him to be sick forever. All right. Now I know I'm sort of exaggerating, but there really is a pull in this direction. Chronic diseases are. A lot of money goes into that. Hardly anything goes into serious, quick cures for chronic diseases, of which the vaccine is, is the, the perfect example. Um, research is directed towards very, very profitable things. So uh, middle, middle class um, Westerners, you know, who suffer from high blood pressure and things like that, there's a lot of research goes into that. But nothing, virtually nothing goes into malaria. It's, well, I, I shouldn't say it's ironic. Most of the money that goes into uh, malaria research right now is, comes from Bill Gates. So he made his millions off us from his computers, and now he's actually sinking some stuff into um, third world health problems. It's very, it's very noble. There are serious problems with Bill Gates. He's a bully in any third world country. He's a complete bully. He takes over. Uh, uh, indigenous local people are, are often quite miffed at him moving in and taking over the territory. And he also insists on patents for everybody. He will not violate the general theme of patents. After all, his whole life has been based on uh, intellectual property rights. But, but there is a generous spirit behind it. I, I can't deny it. And he puts a lot of money into, uh, into a good cause. Um, there is a, a, a research that goes into um, what seems to me just the outright creation of diseases. I've got a cure, give me a disease. And uh, Serafam is probably uh, a nice example of this. So Serafam uh, is a little pill, and it will solve the problem of any woman who has um, PMDD. What on earth is PMDD? Many of you will know it by now. But this is the replacement for um, premenstrual syndrome. This is premenstrual dysphoric disorder. And virtually every woman has it from the time she starts having a period until, um, until she stops having periods. And what she needs is a dose of Serafam. What is Serafam? Serafam is Prozac, except the pill has changed color. I bet you can guess what color the new pill is, or you'll come close. You, won't, you probably won't get it right, but you'll be close. What do you think it is? It's lavender. <laughs> nice try. <laughs> okay. Now, let me surprise you now. A lot of what I've been saying is a hard sell because there is, um, ever since uh, Thatcher and Reagan, there's been a, a very common conception in, in Western society that capitalism is simply the winner, especially with the, uh, with the end of uh, the Soviet Union. Capitalism is obviously the only successful way to structure a society uh, because it is innovative, it is efficient, it can, it can do everything for you. And in the medicine case, what that means is that for-profit medicine is going to give us products that will improve our health much better than any other way of organizing medical medicine in general. All right? So um, let's actually look at this and see if it's true. So the general claim is profit-driven medicine is innovative. We have great products thanks to them, and often even people who criticize the pharmaceutical industry will acknowledge that. In fact, almost everybody I know, even the st 
strongest critics of the pharmaceutical industry will, will acknowledge that. And there, they usually, then their response is more regulation. We've got to regulate these guys and make sure they don't cheat. That's, that's how they, they want to tackle some of these serious problems. But they don't ever doubt that, that real creative innovation is coming from free enterprise medicine. Is it true? Is it actually true? What bloody evidence do we have for this? Turns out, not much. Watch. The, the US Food and Drug Administration has the mandate where they have to license any drug that passes um, uh, clinic, appropriate clinical trials. And passes it just means it beats a placebo. That's all it has to do. If it beats a placebo, the FDA has to license it. Ah, beats a placebo and doesn't have inappropriate side effects. Okay? I mean, it can have some side effects, but they have to be, you know, weighted against the uh, whatever you're dealing with. So, I mean, if it's a life-saving drug, but it makes your hair fall out, that's okay. That's an acceptable side effect. All right? If it cured your headache but made your hair fall out, <laughs> that wouldn't be. All right? Now, what the US FDA does is they, keep an, they kept an internal um, record, a judgment, their own private judgment of, of, the, of the drugs that they were, were dealing with. Which ones did they think were actually real innovations, good stuff? Which ones were old drugs that had had a significant improvement? They'd been seriously tweaked and improved, okay? That would be good stuff too. And which drugs were largely useless? Most of the useless drugs are so-called Me Too drugs. So when Prozac came on the market and made billions for Eli Lilly, then every other drug, major drug company wanted to have a, a, a Prozac-like drug. The, the, this class of drugs are known as SSRIs for selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. And Zoloft is another example of this. So there was tons of them out there, and they're all rivals to one another, but they essentially do the same thing. Um, and, uh, but the first one, Prozac, let's suppose it was, it was really a good thing, and then everything else is just me too. It's just a copy. It's, it actually doesn't contribute anything to general health. All right, so uh, the US FDA classified them as follows. They found this is over a period, a uh, five-year period, in, um, from uh, 98 to 2002, and they had a total of 415 drugs that they, uh, that they licensed, okay? They said 14% were new innovations. 9% were significant uh, improvements over old drugs. So that's a quarter of them was, was good stuff, but three quarters were more or less useless, but they're obliged to license them, okay? That was their view. Now, if you pick a uh, year, I, I just picked the last year for, by the way, this information is no longer available. You know why? Because the drug company didn't like them doing this. And they petitioned the uh, Bush administration, and the Bush administration told the US FDA, naughty, naughty, you can't do that anymore. So we're, we don't know what the FDA thinks about the drugs that they license. In the last year of this, 2002, the FDA approved 78 new drugs, and of it, seven, they classified seven drugs as uh, either outright new innovations that were good or improvements over old drugs that were good, okay? Seven. Not one was produced by free enterprise medicine. Not one. All the good stuff was produced by universities with NIH-type funding government taxpayer funding. The private world doesn't give you much. And if you'll forgive me for saying so, they're a pack of, a pack of real second raters. If you want to know who the, the really good scientists are when it comes to medical work, you'll find them in, in places like the biology department or the, the biochemistry department at a, at a good university like Dalhousie or Western or UBC or Toronto or wherever. You won't find them You'll find some clever people in, in the drug industry, but most of them are actually re real serious working uh, um, scientists in, in ordinary university jobs. Okay? Just keep this in mind. Not a bloody one produced by a US company, all by universities. 
taxpayer funded, not private money at all. So if you want to know where cleverness and innovation come from, it's not the private sector at all. Okay, now there's a regulation mindset. And um, this is very common. As I say, almost everybody who worries about these sort of problems just tries to think up new regulations that will catch the culprits and make them behave properly. Okay, if only we could enforce those regulations, everything would be fine. The biggest of all is the um, disclosure rules. You have to tell, you know, when you send off a, a, a research article to a journal like JAMA or New England Journal of Medicine or something like that, you have to fill out this disclosure form and tell, and tell people what, what um, financial connections you might have to people who are going to produce this, um, this drug, who funded your research and so on. And people do that. <clears throat> Excuse me. I've got a cold, and I'm, I'm not sure my voice is going to last. <clears throat> okay, so you have to fill out forms like this, and people do. But by God, people can be clever. I mean, really clever, while being honest. Well, they're dishonest, but but they're honest by the rules. My favorite example of all is a guy who regularly used to write reviews for various medical journals, and he discussed various drugs that had just come on the market. Uh, these are really important reviews. They're not original pieces of research, but they're the kind of thing that uh, an ordinary doctor would read. Because if your family doctor wants to know what's, what's, what's the latest in blood pressure medicine, you know, so I can recommend it to my patients, the doctor will re read these review articles because they are, you know, the synoptic information, so you're not going to pour through research articles. So anyway, this guy used to regularly write these things, and he was quite highly critical very often of the products that he was discussing. And he'd fill out the disclosure form. He said, I'm not taking a penny from any of these guys. And it was true. He wasn't taking a penny. What he did was own um, a little stock company in the New York Stock Exchange that operated on the stock exchange, and they regularly sold short. And so anytime he was about to review a product by Eli Lilly or Glaxo or something like that, they'd immediately buy, uh, um, they'd sell. They didn't own the stock. You know what selling short is. They'd sell Eli Lilly stock. Out comes this damning review. People read it and say, oh my God, that product's not going to go anywhere. And suddenly the stock would drop 5%. And then they can buy the stock and pay the, uh, for what they uh, uh, sold. You, you know how selling short goes? You're, you're predicting it's going to go down rather than predicting it's going to go up. So it's true. He actually had no financial connection to, to uh, Eli Lilly in the form of taking um, um, you know, speaker's fees or consultant fees. Lilly had never sent him to Hawaii in February and so on. But by God, it was a horrible conflict of interest. And it was, it was hard to find him out. I don't know how he was found out. Okay. Anyway, these uh, rules often have little or no effect. So what if somebody says, yep, uh, here's my work, and yep, uh, Eli Lilly uh, regularly pays me to do stuff. It actually has no effect on people. You know, people just read it, and, and what are you going to do? Okay, the guy told me he's... Uh, He's making money off this. Do I now throw it in the garbage? No, you won't do that. You'll, you'll still read the data and probably be influenced by the, by the alleged results that are coming out there. There was a really interesting rule that was, that was uh, uh, proposed by the International Committee of Editors of Medical Journals, which is about 15 of the, the major journals. And they required that any clinical trial had to be registered before it was carried out. You had to say, here's what we're going to do, okay, and here's what we're aiming to establish, and all of that. You had to say that in advance. You didn't have to publish your result, but what it meant was if you published something else, you know, a couple of years down the road, people could go back and check. And they say, oh, you tried to test something like this, you know, a few years ago. It didn't work out, did it? We want to see that data because you probably found something really nasty and you found a way of getting around it in the test so it doesn't show up in the test. We want to see that. Now, this is really valuable information. It's not as good as being able to control the test yourself, but it's a, 
it's not a bad plan B. Well, the trouble is, it turns out they're not even enforcing it. Now, half the journal articles that are published in, in even in JAMA, who was the leader of the pack asking for this, half the journals public, published in JAMA have, have, have not been pre-registered. They're just ignoring their own rule. So it's really, it's, it's just, well, what the hell. Okay, let me tell you about the state of Massachusetts, which tried to bring in a, um, trying to bring in a uh, sunshine law. Okay, so here's some of the background facts. More than 70% of US physicians receive gifts from the medical industry. And I'm excluding samples, the free samples that they get. Uh, by the way, free samples are a terrible idea. That, uh, very corrupting. Tell your doctor, shame on you for accepting free samples. But, um, but 70, look at that, 70% of physicians receive some kind of gift. And gifts can take all kinds of forms. So they can go to information sessions, but they uh, amount to very short little lectures on the latest work, um, usually a bit of you know, indoctrination. But it's in a nice place. You know, it'll be in, in, in Hawaii in February for two weeks. And you stay in a five-star hotel. And your whole family is brought along. So you have this wonderful vacation courtesy of a pharmaceutical company, and you go to an information session one or two mornings a week, you know, that's it. It's really highly corrupting. 70%. Here, look at this, this is a 30 month period. Look at this, look at how much money is involved. So there were 32,000 payments to almost uh, 12,000 physicians worth Almost $77 million. That's averaging about $6,500 um, a doctor. I, 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 it's, I'm sure it's not distributed evenly. Some are getting a huge pile of money, and some are probably getting almost nothing. But that's a hell of a lot of money. And it's easy to you know, turn people's heads with this kind of thing. Even my daughter, all the time my kids were growing up, I used to say, you know what those terrible pharmaceutical companies do, they come and bribe medical students with pizza. You know, uh, once a week the, 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 the pharmaceutical company will come into the medical school and give all the medical students free pizza. I think, my God, how could they be co corrupted for so little? <laughs> and my, I thought my kids had internalized all of this and my daughter's in vet school right now. And it, wasn't, it was just a couple of months ago, she, she was home for the weekend. She said, oh, I got to go, I got to go Monday morning. Why? Oh, well, the pharmaceuticals are coming. This is pizza day. <laughs> okay, so here's the Physician Payment Sunshine Act of Massachusetts. Um, and the aim is to disclose payments publicly. Uh, the thinking is that informed patients will take this into account and make better decisions regarding their own health and uh, the cost of the medication that they're getting. Will it work? Um, this is really an important test case for people who are of a regulation turn of mind. Okay? So what do we know? We, what do we know already? We actually know quite a little bit already about this kind of procedure. The public remains colossally ignorant. Even though that information is there on the internet, they don't know. One in a thousand might actually take the trouble to look it up and figure out what's going on. Um, the real effect of uh, uh, the real selling point, what makes drugs uh, uh, high selling and high use in the United States, unlike Canada, uh, is advertising. Tremendous amount of advertising. We outlaw advertising. Uh, except that the government has allowed some to have to, you know, they just allowed it. Uh, I think like Viagra, <laughs> you see Viagra ads and Cialis ads, you see that on TV all the time. I'm not sure why the government allows that. <laughs> you can speculate. <laughs> but uh, but it's, uh, it, it's sort of allowed. But anyway, Canadians are subject to it because of uh, you watch American television, you read American magazines and stuff like that. So you get it all. 
That's what really matters. It doesn't matter how much information is, about, is out there. Um, although patients are ready to believe that physicians in general may be biased by conflicts of interest, most are resistant to the idea that their own physicians would be biased. And I, that really rings true. I love my doctor. She's been my doctor for more than 30 years. We're growing old together. And I cannot believe she'd be corrupt. But I know, I mean, if I actually think about it, of course she's as susceptible to a, I don't think she could, you couldn't bribe her in some crass way. But I think she's probably as susceptible to, to this kind of influence as anybody. Jeez. Okay. Um, now there's psychological, we know this from psychological work uh, outside of the medical realm. Just, this is, these are just general facts about people. That after disclosure, people consider their duty discharged and they feel free to exaggerate or to adopt the view caveat emptor. So once I tell you, once I tell you um, I'm, I'm going to give you these drugs, by the way, the drugs that I'm giving you um, are produced by Eli Lilly and every year they send me to Hawaii. Did you hear me? Good. And now, thou, now that I've told you, and this is, this is psychological work, I now feel psychologically free to exaggerate the merits of this thing because I have warned you. I gave you fair warning. If I hadn't given you fair warning, I might actually restrain myself and not overdo it just be slightly corrupt. Now I'm going to be really corrupt because I warned you. I said, watch out, I might be corrupt. And then I really turn it on. All right? And this is, we have good psychological evidence. This is how people act. Disclosure can lead physicians to offer biased advice. Two mechanisms involved are what's called strategic exaggeration, the tendency to provide more biased advice to counter anticipated discounting, and moral licensing the often unconscious feeling that biased advice is justifiable because the advisee has been warned. So I don't think sunshine laws like the Massachusetts laws are of any help whatsoever. They're, they're, they're well meant, but they're just not going to be effective at all. Okay, so let me give you a, a quick summary of the problem so far. Um, the current medical model for drug research has led to all of these problems. Market failure, like in antibiotics, corrupting influence in clinical trials, pseudo-health problems, skewing research. This is the most important thing, I think, of all, is the skewing of research. Um, and finally, uh, uh, failure of disclosure problems, even in um, various uh, circumstances. Okay, so an alternative way, alternative to the market model, um, and regulation model is to see, uh, is to, uh, um, well, I offer this as a solution to the problems I've been talking about. Eliminate intellectual property rights in medical research. So all medical research, including clinical trials, should be publicly controlled, publicly funded, and nobody owns the results except us. We own the results. We don't pay patents to anyone anymore in medicine. I'm not claiming this across the board, but in medicine, especially pharmaceutical medicine, no more patents, and it's all publicly funded. And if Eli Lilly wants to carry out experiments, they can do it, but it doesn't, we don't give a damn. It counts for absolutely nothing. We have to carry out those experiments to decide whether it's a good drug or not, and we are not going to grant IP rights to anyone. That's what I claim and you'll get much better medicine for that. Now, um, here are the virtues. It would stop outright corruption because you wouldn't have financial conflicts of interest anymore. I mean, I don't, it's not gonna solve all problems. I mean, people wanna be famous, you know? I'd love to cure cancer, and so I might cheat a little in, you know, in giving you some data. But I'm not tempted by, by uh, uh, the hope of becoming a multimillionaire. And it would allow more rational choices in research direction because it would eliminate um, uh, pressure for creating pseudo-health problems like uh, the Serafam PMDD uh, case. 
It would also um, give us a better um, vaccine policy and antibiotic policy because they're not, it's not um, um, royalties driven. And we can do serious research on things like uh, exercise, diet, as well as drug solutions to health problems. We could pour a ton more money into exercise. Exercise is really, I think, one of the most promising areas. Um, let me tell you something that I'm often reluctant to, to talk about. Uh, a few years ago, it was discovered that Prozac is actually not effective at all. It actually ties with a placebo. And this was discovered when a whole lot of unpublished data was made public. And it was dug up partly under freedom of information um, uh, by a British uh, researcher about five years ago, I think it was. Still not well known. I'll bet a lot of GPs don't even know it yet. Uh, it's, a, it's a placebo. It's a very strong placebo. And that's why a lot of people benefit from Prozac. But its actual efficacy, causal efficacy, is, is just zero. Except in extreme, extreme cases of uh, depression. And I mean really extreme cases. And it's sad. It's, 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 um, it's sort of tragic and comical at one and the same time. People can be so depressed they're catatonic. They actually can't get out of bed. And sometimes in those cases, it's rare, but it happens often enough, people take Prozac and they actually get a bit better. They get well enough to commit suicide, whereas they weren't able to commit suicide prior to that. So in, in some sense, you can almost, well, as I say, it can, you can see how it's both comical and tragic at one and the same time. It's very sad, the whole business. Uh, I think if we had a rational research policy here, that would have been manifestly obvious long ago, long before Prozac came on the market. And we would look at it a lot of different ways. And one of the, uh, the best ways of, of actually getting a effective treatment for, for depression is exercise. There hasn't been that much, and there needs to be a lot more, because we need to know exercise at what time of day, for you know, what health, what your state of health, you know, what sort of exercise is appropriate for you at this stage in your life, given your health, given your age, given your gender, and so on. But right now, exercise looks like it'll, it'll solve um, depression problems in about one-third of people uh, who are in the middle range, not catatonically uh, depressed, but in the, in the seriously depressed, but still sort of functional. It'll pull about one-third into, into the normal range. And that's roughly what Prozac was doing. Prozac was only getting about one-third. So exercise seems is doing at least as well as Prozac, and now we know Prozac was a placebo. An effective placebo, a very good effective placebo. Prozac has a downside. A lot of people commit suicide, because when they're, especially younger people, when they're going on or coming off Prozac. There's a, a huge number of... Um, uh, suicides uh, in that group. And it led to one of the two terrible black eyes my university got and is forever damned for it. Um, uh, we are, uh, uh, one of our units hired um, David Healy, who works on this sort of thing, from Wales. And he was hired and signed the contract, and he, but he hadn't moved yet to Toronto. But in the interim, there was a conference in Toronto and he came for the conference and he gave a talk. And he talked about the suicides associated with Prozac. And he was pro-Prozac at the time. He says it's very good, it's terrific. But in his estimate, there had been about 50,000 suicides worldwide due to Prozac. That's a lot. It's not much, actually, compared with the hundreds of millions of users. But it's still a significant number of people. And he thought there should be some research done on this, you know, to fi figure out who's especially prone and we can you know, take care of the problem. My university fired him on the spot. And that's because that unit, KMH, the Center for uh, Addiction and Mental Health, um, gets a big chunk of money from Eli Lilly. I don't believe that Eli Lilly intervened and said, you fire that bugger or we're cutting you off. I think it was a case of self-censorship. They said, like, we can't have a guy like preaching this message in our place. We're big on drugs. Drugs solve problems. We don't need somebody coming along and telling a bad story about it. So it was a disaster. And my, some of you may remember the story from uh, several years ago. And it was hugely humiliating for my, 
for us. <laughs> uh, Healy sued and won. Uh, there was a private settlement and we're not allowed to know what, what happened, but he was very victorious. And my university has learned an important lesson. And the world now acknowledges that Prozac and other SSRIs are responsible for a lot of suicides. That's no longer denied. Okay, now, um, what, the way I want you to see this is as a natural extension of, of, of national health care plans all over the world. If you live in a country like Canada, France, Britain, Germany, whatever, you've got some version of socialized medicine, and you can easily see this as part of that. This research is not allowed to be patented. It's out of the market economy, just like medicine is. Everybody, everybody has a right to good health care as a right of citizenship, unlike in the U.S. Okay, it's not a commodity like any other. And we can easily bring in research under this umbrella. And this is how you should think of it. Americans, I don't know, the poor buggers will have to figure it out some other way. Though they could think of it as merely a return to 1979. The disaster in here is all stems from the uh, Bayh-Dole Act of 1980, which said, uh, which, where the U.S. government said prior to that, if you had public funds, you can't patent. And then in 1980, they said, from now on, you can take public funds and you can patent anything that is a worthwhile discovery. That's what changed everything. And at that point, the private companies became involved. And, they, and, and still, American taxpayers pay for most research. And they pay for all risky research. And then the, and then the drug companies who, who do like top-ups and stuff like that, you know, they, they skim off um, the, the big benefits. Okay, um, I'm not going to be able to get through my whole talk. Uh, I had two futures in mind, so I, I, the only thing I'll end up with now is uh, this. You may think this is uh, science policy and politics. It is, but it is also science, a, a, case of, a case study in scientific method. If, if, you want, if you're worried about the quality of research, you actually have to organize the scientific community in a certain way. And the, the way it used to be organized was okay. You just leave all these smart people, you give them a little money, and you leave them alone, and they actually are pretty damn good. Once you introduce patents, and, and uh, you end up corrupting the process, and that has to be withdrawn. And we go back to something like, um, I mean, I don't want to sound naive, like there was a golden age or something like that. that. That's too naive to say anything like that. But we can get the patents out, and we can get the corrupting influences out. And this is a case of reorganizing the research uh, community in medicine for the sake of better medicine. Okay? So you can see how the philosophy of science, which is concerned with what is good scientific method, can be intimately tied to the politics of science in a way that is normally not thought about inside philosophy of science circles. Okay, now uh, I'm, I'm, I'm going to stop there. I'll, I'll just, in, a, in a two sentences, tell you what I'm leaving out. Um, a couple of months ago, there were two really interesting things happened. One is the... Um, um, there was a new policy that came out for statin use, uh, produced by the American, American Heart Association and the American College of Cardiology. And so they made recommendations about the use of statins, and it's almost ludicrous, and it was uh, highly controversial and even farcical, uh, all of this stuff. It amounts to... Um, a huge increase in who should take statins. And if you do the arithmetic for the whole world, it turns out that a billion people should now be taking statins. A billion people. And what it means is that statins that came in in the mid-90s, by the year 2020, will have had total sales of a trillion, a trillion dollars. That's what this policy will lead to. A trillion dollars in sales of statins. It's unbelievable. Virtually every African American who's uh, over 40 should be taking statins, according to the new recommendations. The other thing that came out at the same time was a, um, a, a study on exercise. 
And it was really spectacular, some of the results. So it was a meta-study. They looked at a whole lot of studies uh, involving various conditions like heart disease, uh, stroke rehabilitation, and so on, and tried to figure out what, what procedures are best for uh, tackling these sorts of problems. And they looked at drug solutions and exercise solutions. And they found that, that uh, in one case, uh, drug solutions were actually better than exercise. But in the others, exercise was as good, and in the case of stroke rehabilitation, exercise was way, way better than any drug intervention in a person's life. It was really wonderful, uh, some of the, the, these results. But the trouble is, it, we, there's just not enough exercise results. So they were able to study, you know, 300 and odd things, but only about 50 involved exercise. All the others involved uh, drugs. And uh, so money needs to go into exercise, but it's not going to go if uh, patents are what's driving all of this. So I think I'm going to stop on uh, that note. Thank you. There goes my money from E.I. Lilly down the toilet. Uh, we have time uh, for about 20, 25 minutes of questions. There are two mics here because we're filming it, so I want people to come up to the mics and I'll just recognize them in alternate ways. There's all kinds of people from policy, philosophy of science, some science people. The president of King's College is now gone. Uh, <laughs> he was very, very keen on the market. Um, it would be nice to hear from him. So just come to the mic and we'll recognize you uh, one after another, please. So you're recognizing me? Yeah, I recognize you as Tom Vincent. I've never seen you before in my <laughs> life. Um, let, let me focus on this question of the, uh, of the cost of uh, testing a drug. This seems to me to be a, a critical issue, perhaps the root of all of the evils that you describe. And it also is a problem for your approach. I mean, if, uh, if research is carried out in the universities in the way university professors uh, and researchers carry it out, I think that sounds great. Uh, but if it costs $200 million to test a drug, you are confronting this sort of a selection process problem. Uh, it's, a, it's a funnel problem. You have this many uh, promising ideas, and you have this many you can fund. And I don't know, frankly, if, uh, if academic panels are going to do a better job than the free enterprise system. Maybe. So the, the cost of, um, but that's not my, the focus of my question, the cost of, of uh, testing a drug. Now, if it costs much less than that, you would have various opportunities, including perhaps an opportunity to have a large, maybe a, uh, a venture capital system with, uh, with uh, independent labs and some of the benefits of innovation, of uh, efficiency, when you would have a genuine uh, sort of competitive environment. You, c you can't, of course, have that when you have uh, costs of these vast amounts of money. So I want to comment on this. It, it, I myself cannot believe that it costs $200 million for uh, smart people to figure out whether taking a pill is going to uh, cure uh, sniffles or not and, and not harm or harm uh, uh, not a lot of people. The human intellect is capable of taking just scraps of information and projecting deep and profound understanding from that. Uh, I understand that we know more or less how the universe evolved within one trillionth of a second after the Big Bang. And on what evidence? Just a smidgen. So I, I myself think it must be that there are factors, perhaps political, regulatory, financial, there are a huge lot of epistemologically extraneous factors that drive these costs <coughs> through the roof. Um, my guess is if we were able to really efficiently take our evidence and get probable results out of it. We could do it for much, much less. And if we were able to do that, then a whole a lot of these evils uh, would just go away. What do you think? I, I actually agree with an awful lot of what you said. Uh, let me tell you why they, they do cost a lot of money. And that's because the standard ideology is what's called evidence-based medicine, is the, is the one and only way to approach these problems. I haven't addressed that problem. 
I just took it for granted, and that'll give you these kinds of costs. Ev uh, So-called evidence-based medicine is in, in evidence-based medicine. There's a hierarchy of what what evidence, what it, good evidence is, and at the very top, and the standard expression is the gold standard for evidence, is a randomized clinical trial, and it is in fact demanded by um, uh, all uh, licensing agencies for uh, uh, drugs. They'll make very, very, very rare exceptions. Uh, but in almost everything else, that's what you have to do. And if you're doing it and, you're, and it's on a huge number of patients, it's really going to cost a lot of money. Well, but, it, but it isn't necessary. No, I agree it's not necessary. And, and in fact, there was a really interesting article in the, it may have been the New York Times today, about some very prominent person in, I think in the U.S. government, who's involved in psychiatry. And he has declared he, he will no longer have anything to do with the um, uh, DSM, the latest DSM-5, is it? DSM-5? He won't have anything more to do with it. And he doesn't, and, and from now on, uh, for new proposals in psychiatric medicine, he wants a causal story of what the hell's going on. See, randomized clinical trials don't pay any attention to causes. They're just looking, take the pill, let's see who gets better. And, uh, but if you could tell a causal story of what on earth is going on here, you don't need that kind of huge study. You, you could probably get by with Mill's methods, for instance, okay? And that would be a hell of a lot cheaper and a hell of a lot better. Um, I'm willing to uh, go along with that. Uh, but I, let, let me just say, that will be, that'll be the next stage after you've socialized medical research, then you can start letting serious statisticians and philosophers of science and biologists who have, you know, good sense about what the hell's going on here at a, at a deeper level and not worrying quite so much about massive correlations of, you know, taking this drug and having this effect. Thanks. Let's go, you had your hand up first, Pearl, so come down and... <clears throat> I was wondering if you could speak a bit about the introduction of alternative medicine um, into the system, which, to my understanding, is largely unpatentable because of yeah. the personal um, relations necessary. Um, I actually don't have much sympathy with alternative medicine. I'm very much a critic of the pharmaceutical industry, but I'm not a critic of what you might call modern techniques, good techniques of figuring out how the world works. Uh, I think that there should be, when, when something in alternative medicine looks like it might be promising, I think it should be subjected to real evidence. And if it's good, make it medicine. It's not alternative anymore. It's just good medicine. Uh, I have no, in principle, objection to any particular thing that goes on. But I, think, I do think there's a lot of just sheer nonsense and wishful thinking. Uh, homeopathy has got to be the worst. It's but, just garbage. I hope I'm not treading on your toes. It's okay, but I was just wondering, because exercise is almost an alternative medicine. Sorry? Exercise, because in a way it can't be mass produced. Oh, excuse me. Uh, you're, you're, you're right. And in that sense, I'm in favor of that particular alternative medicine. I'd like it to be regular medicine. Usually when people talk about alternative medicine, they have in mind various uh, concoctions that you can find in a, in a health food store. That's the sort of thing I had in mind, and, and I don't favor that. I think a lot of people do themselves a very great deal of harm, and it's an incredibly expensive business. You know, it's not cheap medicine at all. It's often very dangerous medicine, and it's, it's hurting people. I was just thinking of, um, of a lot of uh, hospitals in um, like Korea and China which have started infusing Eastern medicine, but yeah. yeah. There are some things in traditional Chinese medicine that I'm sure are effective. In fact, I heard the best evidence the other day uh, for acupuncture, that it actually is definitely effective for things like arthritis. And you won't believe when, when I tell you what the source was. Uh, it was a, um, a research area that used a lot of apes, in the, and they were closing it down. And, uh, and so it just became, a, it was a story about 
what to do with old apes that had been used as research subjects. And it was interesting how the apes uh, cooperated with the researchers. So the, the apes would, uh, would be you know, given a, a, a drug or something like that, and then they had to give blood samples at periodic things. And, they would, and, the, and the ape was never forced. The ape was always bribed and had to negotiate. And the ape would say, all right, I'll give you a blood sample, but you, no, I, won't, I don't want one treat, I want two treats. Okay? Then I'll give you a blood sample. And then they discovered something truly remarkable about acupuncture with the older apes that were arthritic. These are mostly chimps, I think. And um, the older chimps would, uh, sub would be willing to subject themselves to acupuncture, and they didn't ask for a treat. And the, the indication is overwhelming that, that they were actually getting pain relief from the acupuncture, relief from their arthritic pain. So I thought, I mean, there's not even a, there's no, I don't think there's any placebo there. In, in, in so many cases, you know, the placebo effect is really powerful. I don't think in the ape case, a placebo could possibly be working there. I think they genuinely were, were having pain relief from acupuncture. Um, and so I'm, I, you know, I think a lot of research is, I'd be happy with a lot of research on that. Cool, thank you. Thanks a lot for the talk. Uh, so I'm largely sympathetic to what you're saying, um, but there seemed to be this one point in, in your uh, argument that strikes me as like very crucial. Uh, the, probably the strongest argument against your case is the uh, sort of like uh, the progress of, of medicine um, being like related to I guess like capitalist enterprise or something like that. And you, you presented us with this pretty interesting evidence from the FDA where there was like this very small amount of uh, research that they thought was actually like useful. But that was only from like 98 to 2002. Do you have any like analogous evidence from like the 80s or something? No. Because I, I don't know, like maybe 20%, was it 12 or 20% of? No, no, the interesting thing about that, um, maybe the percentage of good stuff was the same percentage uh, 50 right. years ago. No, the interesting thing about that is, is who produced the good stuff. That's, that's where the moral sure. comes from, because it wasn't coming from the free enterprise researchers. It was coming from tax-funded research. Yeah, and I just, I just feel like that would be a lot stronger if you could uh, produce well, you, you see, you're not going to have good comparisons with 50 years ago because it was all tax-funded research, either tax-funded or foundation-funded, like the Heart Foundation, the Kidney Foundation, the Terry Fox Foundation, right. you know, things like that that pr produce money for research. But it comes, uh, you know, there's no intellectual property rights coming with that research. Right. So, so you, you're really, you're really stuck with having to look at data over from 1980 up until, up until now. Uh, but of course, Bush wouldn't let him do that anymore. Yeah. All right. That's all. I okay. <laughs> I, I think you have to go all the way, though, because if um, you know, even if the cost of drug trials was greatly reduced, it would still, in this country, dwarf the amount of money that people seem to be willing to spend on medical research, <coughs> as pure, pure medical, real medical research. And so you'd also have to socialize the production of drugs, I think, because otherwise where's the money going to come from to pay for this? I don't think the public would support a hundredfold increase in the CITR budget in order to They would if they found that uh, they don't have to pay royalties for drugs anymore. See, the, the, the well, thing somebody is... Got, somebody's got to produce the drugs, and I think it has to be the government that produces the drugs yeah. at the same time. So you That's have right. to socialize the whole business. Yeah. Not just I'm in favor of socializing the whole business. Yeah, well, yeah. I but I, I mean, for people like, uh, in fact, Tom, Tom, who started the, the ball rolling here, when he said he wants venture capitalists to put up this money because he thinks taxpayers won't, won't be willing to put up such big sums. But the thing is, I think taxpayers are smart enough to realize they're going to pay for that one way or the other. They're either going to pay for the $200 million uh, clinical trial or they're going to pay for the $800 million clinical trial. They'll pay for it through taxes in the 200, or they'll pay for it in, in royalties in the 800. I'm offering you a deal. Tom, I'm only charging you 25%. Come on. Research, uh, just as a comment, 
You can't talk no. the back there for two no. reasons. One, you did, and the second is the mic. But wait, I, I, I the actually, mic's not on wait. you there, Tom. I haven't, I haven't actually finished because I want to. I actually want you. I wanted you to tease out your proposal a little more because I'm not. Well, I mean, I think the. Um, you know, if I'm a tax, as a taxpayer, I might not be willing to pay that extra tax because I might think, well, I'm not going to get, I'm not going to need that drug. So in some ways, uh -huh. I'm not sure that's going to work. Mm -hmm. um, well, I mean, I just think you, do, you have to socialize the production of, of pharmaceuticals, and, and then obviously be many fewer pharmaceuticals produced because presumably there wouldn't, yeah. be, there wouldn't yeah. be any Me Too drugs. But it seems to me the money to support all these clinical trials, because we have to have some form of clinical trials, is going to have to come from somewhere, and I don't think the taxpayers are, well, I don't see the government wanting to increase the funding for medical research that much, and probably most people would regard this as medical research. I, I could have, as a, as a tentative guideline, I could say, well, how much do we spend on drugs? And I'll take that, yeah, but that's seen as a minus the royalties. But that's, that's seen by most people as a voluntary expenditure, which they might not even have to make if they don't get sick, whereas the taxes are going to have to pay the taxes anyway, so I'm not Really? Sure. You think so? Well, I, I mean, I'm not sure people put those in the same pocket uh, baskets in their head, but, um, you know. Well, I'm not sure. I'm not sure how much, um, I'm not sure how much we would pay. I reckon it would actually, the whole shebang would cost us less than we pay now because we pay, but so much of the money yeah. that we pay well, that, now goes into corporate profits. Uh, would, be really nice, would be really nice to see you monetarize the argument. So how much money is this costing people? I mean, it's huge, I'm sure, but it would be nice, and it would be very difficult to actually estimate it, but it would be possible to try to estimate it. Hmm. Yeah, okay. you're right. Okay, Letitia, make sure you speak into the mic because we're uh, people across the land want to hear you. So just a quick comment for people. Uh, David Healy is actually around town this next week giving papers, so if you want to hear more of the sort of thing that Jim was Terrific. talking about, uh, you have an opportunity next week. So I, I wanted to ask a couple of things. First of all, the 200 million mark is, uh, I assume, what it currently costs to do medical clinical trials under the paradigm. So if we stop paying physicians to enroll patients, we're going to cut those costs down. Yep. And if we start, I, I mean, I assume you're also looking at the um, you know, the initial chemistry that's done. Yep. And so a lot of that is the kind of thing that grad yep. students and postdocs can do with grad student postdoc yep. funding. Yep. And, uh, you know, it seems to me a lot of that 200,000, oh, 200 million could actually work into the education and practice of the university quite seamlessly. Sure. Um, so it's a kind of apples and oranges problem because yes. it's not going to be 200 million straight up anyway. No. Quite right. um, and we will, we will not carry out tests on a lot of drugs that yeah. are being carried out now because we just yeah. think they're useless. Yeah. 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 Or of negligible benefit. Yeah. So that's one point. Uh, the other thing that I think uh, is perhaps more interesting is the role of university administrations who I feel like maybe they're they're being paid off by the system at the moment, the way they're negotiating it. Uh, and I, I just wanted to know what your th thoughts were about the role of university administrations in terms of pandering to pharmaceutical agencies and um, not yeah. providing a real alternative vision. Yeah. Um, I, I feel really sorry for universities almost everywhere in North America because they're under pressure from their various governments. Um, Ontario is uh, our university is under pressure from the province of Ontario, but also the federal government, you know, to, to enter into more of these public-private partnerships. And in medical research, that means you know doing joint research. Uh, there's no public-private partnership for um, research into depression and exercise, because there's no private partner who wants to spend a penny on that. Um, and so, yeah, uh, we get nice things out of it. And, and the, the higher echelon administration will point to those. And, hey, look at this beautiful new building that we've just got here. And um, look at all the people we can hire and so on, and students we can support and so on and so on. But I think it's, a, it's really a, a, an illusion. 
and we're, we're just getting crappy medicine out of it. And our mandate as universities is to actually, I mean, corny as it sounds, <laughs> you know, it's to actually enlarge real knowledge and, and teach, of course, too. Uh, and I think we're um, uh, sacrificing it in, um, in a significant way. And even the, the products that, that are coming out of, out of all of this are, are, many people are aware that older, older drugs are vastly superior to newer drugs. Not just they were really great in their time and the new stuff is poor relative to its time, but absolutely. So in one NIH study, taxpayer-funded study in the U.S., um, it turns out that about 80% of the U.S. public have a form, who have high blood pressure, have a form of blood pressure that is best treated with an old-fashioned diuretic, which is about 75, 80, 85 years old, this, this thing. It's a completely generic now. Um, and it costs a, a, just a couple of pennies a day to, for this. And they're not being given it. They're being given drugs that are very powerful, nowhere near as effective, but full of side effects and really expensive. And they're being given by their GPs in many cases. And the GP simply doesn't know. It's appalling how little GPs know about a lot of stuff. And here's something even more appalling. Um, you won't believe me when I tell you. You'll think this is a Hollywood movie. Uh, if you want a job, if you're young and you're looking for a job, and you want to be well paid by the pharmaceutical industry, you're not a researcher, but you want to be a salesperson for the pharmaceutical industry, you go around, you talk to doctors, explain what's new, why they should be giving the patients this rather than that, and so on. Who do they look for, for to fill these jobs? Good paying jobs. You think they want somebody out of university with, say, a biochemistry degree or maybe a little biology or something? Guess what they do in university that is surefire for a job with the pharmaceutical industry? None of you can guess. Cheerleader. <laughs> I'm not kidding. The number one job criteria, <laughs> the number one qualification for getting a job as a drug salesperson in the US is cheerleader. For the football team, the basketball team, it doesn't matter. You've got that kind of personality. You go into the doctor and you go, rah, 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 Prozac, yay, Prozac. Or I don't know what they do. It's, it's just, it, 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 if this were, if you saw it on television, you'd swear it was a Monty Python skit or something like that. But it's, it's really true. Um, as soon as I was going to cut off the questions, a pile came to uh, ask. So if you go fast, we will take these three questions. Uh, no, uh, the short answers. Yes, sir. Just a yes or a no. <laughs> yeah, it's just a quick question, um, two-part question, basically. Um, if it, what you consider should happen uh, actually happens, then what's uh, like what's there not to stop the capitalists uh, making the drugs and just sort of saying, oh well, this drug is better than uh, the drug that's made by uh, the universities or the other system, right? Like why why couldn't they just do that? Like, Don't let them sell it. They have to be licensed. We just refuse to license. But they could them. just sort of create their own licenses, in a sense. No, you know, no, like, no, I mean, no, like no. They, it wants, wants to stop them. Even the Harper them. government is not going to let them do that. <laughs> you okay, can't okay. make any crap and go out on the street corner and sell it and say, "This will cure cancer." They'll put you in jail in five minutes, and rightly so. Okay. Okay. Well. Okay. Anyway, um, the second part was like, um, in a sense. Uh, you sort of take it like an ethical stance that medicine should be what is um, sort of the forefront of um, society in a sense, right? Uh, and I think that um, what was there to stop a taking a kind of more groundwork approach, saying, well, people are in a sense like harming themselves first, and that's why they need medicine, like for say obesity or smoking or alcohol or other anything else, really? Like why? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that's a, that's a very good idea, but that that's a different issue inside medicine. I mean, I, I'm, I'm completely sympathetic. Sometimes it's just called preventive medicine or something. Yeah, yeah. I, yeah, I'm all in favor. But, but that's actually a different issue. Like, I'm talking about people who are sick right now, they've got high blood pressure. You know, how should we be treating them? Because like the immediate as opposed to the, yeah. the long. Okay, yeah, yeah. Okay. You're, you're talking about very long range uh, sorts of things. Okay. okay. Two blistering fast questions. <laughs> 
I can short I can shorten this comment actually significantly. It seems like yeah. great minds think alike. Uh, <laughs> following it. on the previous first comment, you say that we would not be allowed to sell the drugs, okay? But you hinted in your talk we consume American television, we watch American commercials, so on and so forth. All of the drugs that would be produced by the American private, sorry, the American private system, which would not stop, right? What would we do with those drugs? What would we do with that progress? Furthermore, in comparing the size of the American private industry with whatever innovations that you know, Canada could make, how would we be able to better serve our patients? Yes, okay, you touch on, on something that's really important. I'll try to be extremely quick. Canada can't do any of this on its own. First of all, we'd be clobbered by the WTO. The US would say, F you, and crush us, just like that, because we send several billion dollars a year in royalty payments to the United States. We need the cooperation of Europe and a big chunk of the world to all get on side and say, we want to socialize medical research. We not only want socialized medicine, it's not part of the, the free enterprise market, and we want to put research into that same thing and then take on the Americans there. So we can't do it ourselves. Literally head to head. Yeah, yeah, oh, it's a big fight. There'll be blood. <laughs> Crimea. Uh, <laughs> uh, my question is just about uh, how, how would you convince a taxpayer to then support malaria research when they live in North America and it's not even on the fringe of their mind? Right? That, that's a good question. I don't know that you can. You, you'd have to do it in the form of this is our contribution as a rich nation to the poor. It's like, for, think of it as foreign aid. Part of our medical budget is, a, is you could think of as foreign aid. But we already dislike giving foreign aid. Like, there's always, there's always, always these great fights. Like, as, as terrible as it is, and I'm not then suggesting we lie. it's a good alternative. We lie like we do all the time. We say, this research is really important <laughs> now, even though we can't tell what its long-range consequences are. But when we cure malaria, we're going to learn about certain mechanisms, and then we throw in some colorful jargon and say, this could have enormous payoff for cancer of middle-aged white Canadians uh, 30 years from now. I actually, I don't mean to make completely light of the problem. It's a serious, interesting problem. But, but people will usually go along with a fair bit of stuff. Good. Thank you very much, Jim, for a very enlightening talk. Uh, keep your eyes peeled for the other events that will be online for this. Uh, Jim is around for two days or so, at least one, for one tomorrow. More. Uh, at 11.30, he's speaking at the Dalhousie University Club on teaching about images. Students can come and meet with him tomorrow at 1.30 in the Scotia Bank Room on the top floor. And at 3.30, he's going to give the philosophy colloquium on mathematics pure and applied over in the philosophy department at Dalhousie. Uh, there's a reception now somewhere. I think it's up in the Wilson Common Room. Uh, oh, it's right outside here. You don't have to go upstairs. Uh, so please uh, join us for further discussion outside. Thank you. <laughs>